Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Tattoo Historians Digital Conference. So happy to have you all join us. We've been having some tremendous numbers all day for a beautiful Saturday, especially those of you who have been joining since 10 a.m. Uh, you guys have been hanging in there pretty tough, and we're very happy that you have. A uh, big shout out one more time to our sponsor, trhistorical.com. They've been really great, and uh, they have some awesome swag on there, so go check them out. Uh, right now, I'm happy to have Nick Otawong on with us. Nick is a Master of Arts student studying LGBT U.S. history at the University of Colorado, Denver. His research focuses primarily on Colorado and Denver LGBT history. Prior to his studies at CU Denver, Nick earned a Master of Arts in Higher Education with a concentration in college student development from the University of Denver. His undergraduate is in history from Colorado State University. Nick is a proud born and raised Coloradoan, proud Asian and Caucasian gay male with the belief that everyone deserves to live their true authentic self. And I couldn't agree more, Nick. Nick's research is focused on the Mattachin Society and the Daughters of Belitis, two homophile organizations in the U.S. starting in 1950 and ending in approximately 1970. His focus on these two organizations is through a few specific focuses, the national organization, including its founding and purpose, the national conventions that each organization had in Denver, Colorado in 1959 for the Mattachine Society, and 1968 for the Daughters of Belitis, and how the organizations had a presence in Denver, which includes their significance for the Denver area LGBT community. And Nick, you said this is the perfect timing to be doing this presentation, right? Yeah, today uh, this weekend, Pride Weekend in Denver. So um, be able to give some history about what we're celebrating in our city today. That's fantastic. And Nick, thank you so much for being yeah. on with us today. It's, this is going to be great. And absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, my friend. I'm going to bring up your presentation now, and I okay. will let you get to work. All right, perfect. Well, again, thank you so much, John, for having me and for everybody who's joining. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share some research that I started doing about six months ago, um, and I am hope to have a long-term go at, because um, there's a lot to cover within what I'm doing. So a lot I'm gonna cover in about 20 minutes here um, that hopefully you all will learn more about. Um, John already gave a great introduction to who I am, um, but I just wanted to um, just quickly reemphasize that. Um, one thing that I also um, like to also highlight is pronouns. I think that's something important as well. Um, so I do go by he, him as pronouns. Um, in case you want to have any questions in the chat um, or know how to address me. Um, before I actually go into what I want to talk about today with everybody, I do want to take some moment to recognize a few things that are happening in our society today. Um, the first is it is Pride Month for LGBT plus individuals around the country. Um, Pride was started from a riot at Stonewall Inn in 1969, in which individuals of color fought back against police brutality and harassment. Um, so kind of what we're already seeing again with our African-American and Black and brown friends and family and um, community members. Um, we're seeing that repeat of some of that police harassment at least and some police brutality as well. So kind of going back to what we think about in our past. Um, I also wanna recognize the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening on the country um, and know that that's affecting all of our lives and making us all think about what we're doing in our daily lives. I also would be negligent and I feel like if I didn't recognize the, the pandemic that we're all going through and COVID-19 um, and the victims and family members and thinking about everybody who's had losses and also survived the virus. And then also the black and vibes, black and brown life, excuse me, that have been lost um, throughout the country and the world um, and making sure we don't forget about them. One other thing that we do here in Colorado um, with a lot of the major universities um, and also the museums is land recognition. And so when we think about um, the land that I'm sitting on now in Denver um, and also people in Colorado and all over the country, we do have land that we are sitting on that used to be native land. So the land I and we in Colorado are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and the Ute nations and peoples. And I wanna make sure that we don't forget about that as well. So one thing that a lot of people don't realize that I wanted to kind of talk about is with my presentation today is that's actually a lot of LGBT history that happened even before Stonewall. So here's some dates that are kind of highlights of ones that happened around the country. Um, the Cooper Donut, Donut Riots in Los Angeles in 1959. Dewey's Luncheon Counter Sit-In in Philadelphia um, in April 65. Um, in April 1966, there was a sip-in at Julius's, which is a gay bar. That's only one block northeast of Stonewall Inn. It's still in business today if you ever want to go visit. Um, and then August 1966, there was the Compton Cafeteria Riots in San Francisco, which also included transgender women 
tar uh, targeted by police and fighting back against the police. And then the homophile movement that I'm going to be talking about as well today. So just a quick overview of kind of the LGBT Denver history and who's already written about it, kind of where I'm falling into the larger scheme of history here. Um, the peer-reviewed published article that I know about is Tom Noel. He wrote about gay bars in 1978. We also have a book that came out in 2013 by Brett Everett um, that looks at uh, Denver LGBT history from the beginning to um, about 1970. And by beginning, I mean when um, the first European um, individuals came to the Denver and Colorado area. Graduate student research and scholarship has done, mo most of the research has actually been done in LGBT Denver history through graduate students and their scholarship. So uh, there's two theses that came out, one by Keith Moore, one by Lisa Humphrey Smith. And there's also two PhD dissertations that I looked at specifically for my research, which is Katie Gil Martin's research and P. Aaron Cole's research. I also want to um, mention a couple of scholars that um, are fellow graduate students of mine, um, slash now alumni uh, of my program that have done a lot of great work. David Duffield and Emily Fufiano Kogniak um, are both amazing scholars. Um, David actually also is the program coordinator for the Center on Colfax History Project, which is where you can learn a lot more about LGBT history and find more readings and writings as well. Some primary sources that I used for this project and that you can also go and find your own um, and do your own digging is at Denver Public Library, um, History Colorado, New York Public Library, GOBT Archives in San Francisco, and One Archives in California. I also uh, took a look at newspapers, which include Denver Post, Rocky Mountain News, um, and a little bit at Outfront Magazine, which is a local Denver published magazine. So some of you probably aren't familiar, what is a homophile? A homophile is basically a homosexual male or female. So almost everybody nowadays would be, who's within the LGBT community, um, could call themselves a homophile. Um, the homophile movement um, is an era that went from the 1950s to the 1960s. Um, like I said, uh, ended around 1970 or so. Um, but most historians have been able to piece it together to 1950, 1960. Um, and two of the organizations that fall under this are the Mattachine Society and the Daughters of Elitists, which I'm going to talk about more today. Um, one thing I also want to mention with all of the research that I did is thinking about why I why this research is important. And that's because of what, what the homosexuals or homophiles are actually afraid of um, during this era. So they were afraid of arrest, newspapers, um, Arrest was, they could be arrested for being at a private party, um, at being at a gay bar or being at a gay establishment. Um, newspapers was because their names would be published in the newspaper, which could include to the families finding out about them, um, losing jobs, losing um, apartments and rent because landlords find out um, and having their reputation kind of basically ruined. Um, police harassment, going back to arrests and also targeting establishments. Um, and then yeah, the loss in family and friends um, that are important as well and jobs. So the two homophile organizations I'm highlighting today are Mattachian Society and Daughters of Belitis. Um, first, Mattachian Society is a quick overview of the history. Um, it started in 1950 in, in Los Angeles where three men gathered to just talk and figure out how they could support each other. The original goal was to build a society in which similar groups would, be would not be necessary in the future. Basically meaning they were wanting to make sure that we didn't have to have anything similar moving forward. We still have organizations today to support LGBT communities, but I do think that they met a good goal um, of wanting to build a community together and making sure that we had a community for each other, that, for those of us that identify within the queer or LGBT communities. Mattachine, in case you're wondering what that means, it's actually professional or entertainers and prophets of the nobility, court gestures, and teachers, or in other words, they were fools in medi medieval Southern Europe. Um, and they, they chose this name because it's on mo there's no modern connection um, and you couldn't really associate it easily to being LGBT, so it's a good way to play in hide in plain sight while also being able to get together. The Daughters of Belitis was started in 1955. Um, it was eight women ga who gathered in San Francisco. Um, they provided an alternative place for lesbians that was not a gay bar. So similar to what Madison Society was hoping for was a place to gather and get to know each other. Um, Belitis is, uh, comes from a poem by Pierre Louis um, called Songs of Belitis. Um, and it's, it's skepticism here, but there, there is two women in the poem um, that seem to be women loving women, so they assume that this might be why they chose Belitis over other um, areas. There is a lot of writing on the original meetings that you can look, at, you can read on, including a great book that was written about the Daughters of Belitis group as, as a whole that you can find on Amazon if you want to uh, do additional readings. So looking specifically here in Denver, um, the Mattachine Society um, was founded in 1957 as a Denver chapter. Um, they did have to apply to the 
um, headquarters in, in California. The record of the society's goals, um, the record of the society had goals of community activism and, act, and, and activities found throughout their newsletters. And their newsletters were actually how I um, kind of first learned about this organization and did some more digging. So their newsletters were published from 1957 to 1961. Um, all the ones that I could find have almost all the months in them. They're not fully complete. Um, I do have a goal to eventually get them fully complete if we can. Uh, but you can find the majority of them through the Archives of Sexuality and Gender, which is a database you can access through ma most major universities. Goal was to help homosexuals accept themselves and educate others about homosexuality. Basically, who, who they are and why they're not a really a danger or a threat to society and why they're just normal people like everyone else. Denver also had the privilege of being able to host the National Convention in 1959. I'll talk about that more in a second. The Daughters of Belitis is another for, another organization, again, in Denver. There's no formal chapter that I could find to date. That's something else that I'm looking into for the fu for future research. So if anybody else wants to help look for that, that'd be a great thing to add and help within the historical geography here. Um, local members subscribe to the National Newsletter, The Ladder. So that's how we got most of the idea that there was a presence here in Denver outside of um, a lot of the members would also meet with the Mattachine Society and go on to their meetings as well. And then in 1968, they also were able to host the National Daughters Belitis Convention, which does, to me, at least as a historian, show that they had a good enough presence and a good enough a voice um, that even the national organization saw Denver as a place to come visit and meet it. So I'd mentioned the newsletters. On the right here is one of the covers that, of the newsletters that I just loved. Um, for those of you not from Denver, the building that's on this newsletter cutter is actually the city and county building um, that's right across from the state capitol. So if you ever come visit, that's the building that you'll, you'll be looking at. These newsletters for me provided some direct insight into the activities of what the LGBT community in Denver was doing from about 1957 to 1961. Um, they provide the meeting locations for all their meetings over time. So um, w one of the cool things is it actually helps historians and scholars to be able to look and say, where were these individuals meeting and or where were they living? Um, and these newsletters now give us more of an idea that they were in certain parts of Denver, specifically in the Denver Capitol Hill neighborhood. Um, the, the organization's Denver chapter had to meet the national goals. Um, and they did that by helping help, help homosexuals within Denver accept themselves by doing the weekly meetings, by having the newsletter, by doing um, group activities and things that they could do together to help build community. They helped educate the public through this newsletter that was published on a monthly basis. Educational events, which did include even lecture series from like lawyers. Um, they also had religious organizations that came and talked to the, to the group. Um, and then there's also, again, they had the National Convention in 1959 as another way to help educate the larger Denver community. This map is actually a first for um, Denver LGBT history by actually having a mapping out of where individuals lived and met. So the other different little dots here are actually either meeting locations or addresses of known places that LGBT individuals lived um, from 1957 to 1961. Some notable ones that I wanted to highlight here, number 19 is where the Daughters of Belitis Convention was held. Um, number 17 is where the um, 1959 Madison Society Convention was held. And number 20 is actually a prominent leader that was featured um, in an interview on the podcast, uh, Gay making gay history, um, if you want to find another place to learn more about Denver LGBT history. The, the 1959 convention for Madison Society um, actually was kind of interesting because they um, actually wanted media attention. So they actually reached out to Denver Post and local news TV networks um, to highlight the event. And that put people at risk. And, but they knew that they were putting themselves at risk by getting, the name, getting more information out there um, in their voice to the community. Um, it also brought attention to the Denver Police Department and FBI. So if you see on the, on the document here, this is actually an uh, FBI memo that was um, from one archives in California. Um, and this is actually um, talking about this convention and a few of the specific members as well um, that were part of, this, part of this convention. And if you notice also, if you're looking closely at this document, there's also an address uh, for the Madison librarian. And that's a whole other story I don't have time for today, um, but there's actually a very interesting story about the librarian um, and his interactions with, with the law and the police department. Members come from across the country to attend the convention. So it was not just California, it was not just Denver. People came from Boston, from New York, from Chicago, um, from all over in order to be able to come in, uh, to this meeting. And they held these conventions every year in different cities. 
Um, there, there was one in San Francisco one year, there's one in New York City. Um, so there's a lot of different locations they held them in. When they came to Denver specifically, they met in the Albany Hotel. This hotel was torn down in the 1970s, so it's not currently something you can go visit. Um, but the current location of where the hotel was is where the Hilton Denver City Center is now, which is uh, um, off of 18th in California, um, in, Calif in Colorado. Uh, and a fun thing for me to realize when I was doing this research, I actually work in the building that is now on that land. Uh, my office for my professional position is actually on that area, on that land. So kind of a weird little thing that I learned about even Denver history through this. I also mentioned the Daughters of Belitis. Um, so they had their convention in 1968. Um, the document here on the left is actually a sample of the re a registration guide that they sent out, um, as long as what you could purchase for um, the convention. I do find it interesting um, that you could get a single room for $9 plus tax. I know it's 1960s and we, we obviously have a lot of reasons that prices are different now, um, but just seeing something like that and just thinking back about the, the differences even in money and, and um, income and value and all that as well. Um, this was one of the last conventions that was held of the Daughters of Belize organization before it disbanded in the 1970s. Um, so it was really neat to see that they had a lot of opportunity to meet even within the city here. And it did help for me, at least as a historian, to show that Denver's lesbian community had a strong presence um, and a strong national voice in order to be able to bring something this large to Denver, and Aurora slash Denver. So I was thinking about kind of how does my research kind of add into the, our knowledge already? Um, we've had a lot of scholars already look at Denver history, especially in LGBT history in certain different ways. One is the newsletters I brought forward are actually new primary sources that um, have been mentioned by other historians, but have not, I don't think, had the in-depth deep dive that I've taken with them. It's also helping bring a new interpretation to some of the history we do know, especially of like Capitol Hill neighborhood and some other parts of LGBT history. Um, it shapes all the movement and change to come. So in the 1970s in Denver, there's actually even more changes that the LGBT community fights for. Um, and this, in uh, the 1950s and 1970s, actually helps shape that, uh, that, that groundwork to be able to get to where they need to go in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and it's also uncovering hidden history. Um, the newsletter cover that I highlighted in this talk today is something that I don't know if anybody has seen in 20, 30 years, um, potentially. So it's even bringing back some of the things from the past that um, others might have seen on a regular basis. So for everybody who's joining today, what I really want you to take away from this is to just think about the fact that there's a lot of unknown history that we have about communities, especially the LGBT community, not only in Denver, but across the country. And if you have an interest in LGBT history or even interest in history in general, um, there's always fun ways to find new cool things to discover about your, your community or about your city or about what, any interest you might have. Um, so for me, this was something that I discovered six, seven months ago when I was researching a gay bar in Denver on the, that used to be on the very campus. Um, and I ended up finding these newsletters instead and having an interest in my research, um, kind of have a switch and kind of doing a deep dive in another way. Um, so just want to make sure that everybody has this, this knowledge, but also know that there's a lot more out there still that you can also do yourself. Um, and I would love to have other people jump in and help, um, not only with this knowledge, but uh, all knowledge and all history to help ourselves become the most educated people we can. If you want to learn more, um, I do have a website, it's otowong.com. If you go to my Twitter account, um, it's linked on my Twitter account that I know was shared out today already. Um, you can also email me um, and also go on Twitter and, and follow me and tweet me um, at Nick Otowong on Twitter. I will also put a copy of this presentation onto my website. Um, I also know it's going to be um, available through um, Facebook and through some other, some other um, things like YouTube and things like that in the future. So. I um, want to make sure that everybody has access to this in the future as well. And with that, I think I did about 20 minutes. So I would love to grab some questions if anybody has any. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions that are, are popping up down here. I'll bring one in here. Uh, Kara asks, would you consider doing a comparison with the same time frame, but on the East Coast? Absolutely. And it's something I want to look at because Boston and New York actually had Mattachine Societies and Daughters of Belitis organizations as well. Um, and there's a lot of information on those cities um, out of Boston and out of New York. So, yep, that's one of my next project goals. 
Uh, Nick, I had a, a question myself. Of yeah. When these organizations are formed, especially uh, with Mattachine uh, being in the 19, well, ni late 1950s, is, mm -hmm. are, are, is the FBI keeping an eye on these organizations because of anti-communist things or trying to label them as communists? Yeah, great question. So yeah, almost all the members were former communists um, from at least the founding of the national level and also here in Denver specifically. Um, so there was a lot of interest because of that, but also because they were really interested in homosexuality and what homosexuals were doing. Um, there's actually a great book that came out about F the FBI and they did a whole round of searching just on being homosexual. Um, that if individuals wanna dig, dig more into it, um, there's a great book that was published that I can also add into like a resources. Um, if anybody wants to follow that for the future, I'll have that available. Yeah, that'd be great because I know yeah. a lot of my uh, a lot of my followers love book lists. <laughs> so, I, I have some. I'll send it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and, and obviously, you can add that to the comments on Facebook or wherever after afterwards, Absolutely. sometime this weekend, whenever you have time. That'd be fantastic. I already have a Google Doc that I'm putting together, and I'll just link the doc so awesome. and everybody can get access to that. So, yep. Uh, Kara has one more question here. Uh, who has been your most influential author and professor? Great question, Carrie. Thanks. Um, so my most influential author um, is actually a historian out of Cornell. Her name is Mary Beth Norton. Um, she's done a lot of research on like early America, especially on women and women's history. Um, and um, she wrote a fantastic book about the Salem witch trials, which is why I originally got in touch with her, 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 her writings. Um, my, my most influential professor is actually an adjunct professor that I had in undergrad. Um, Pam von Knaus, who now teaches in the honors program at my undergrad. Um, but she really just helped me hone my interest in history and basically helped me realize I could be a historian and I could do what I wanted to do with my life. So mm. and I see Richard's giving thumbs up on, on Dr. Norton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we have another fan apparently in the comments. Yeah. It is, it is awesome though. When you, even with an adjunct, when you have a professor who just you know, mm -hmm. understand what you want to uh, do or what you want to research or just lights that fire within you that causes yep. you to want to research something. Absolutely. And I've had wonderful professors that are also tenured faculty. Um, but yeah, Dr. Canal specifically stuck out as mm -hmm. someone who really made sure that I knew what, what I was doing was the right thing to do um, mm -hmm. and not to doubt myself. So that's awesome. Nick, I really appreciate this uh, conversation because this is a conversation we need to keep having in society Absolutely. and understanding the history of these organizations and how they were perceived when they first became organizations and as they moved forward, especially when uh, uh, now far too often uh, when, when we disagree on issues of certain things, people are like, oh, that's communist or mm -hmm. that whatever else. It's the, it's the same thing it's like it's like john Meacham says history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme it does, exactly yeah, yeah. and there, and this is there's a lot that still needs to be uncovered so to the mm -hmm. question earlier i don't know if it was Kara's someone's question earlier there's mm -hmm. so much still in the archives i've only touched the, the tip of the iceberg um because i had to do this in about three months so what you just saw was literally three months of me digging um mm -hmm. during a pandemic so right. yeah. um if i had more access to the archives if i had more access to even going to new york or san francisco Mm -hmm. I could have probably uncovered even more than I did. Um, and so that's why this is something that I agree needs to be continuously looked at. And there's honestly a lot more out there that future historians will have access to that will even add to what I just talked about um, or even disagree with me completely. And I want that to mm -hmm. help me see that I'm wrong and why I'm wrong through, through primary sources. I'm just seeing an awesome opportunity for a huge oral history here. <laughs> you know, some former members and all that stuff would just be so impressive. Yeah, and there's actually some of that through One Archive and also through the LGBT Center in San Francisco. Uh -huh. um, they're not digitized, so that's partly oh. why. Like, I would love to go listen to some of these organ, some of these oral histories, because not ever, all of it's been digitized, right. um, but some of them have been. Um, and so that's one. That's uh, one thing that I, a lot of these folks are not. I mean, we're talking 1950s and they're in their 30s for a lot of these individuals. So we're hitting really old ages now if they're still with us. Right. Um, and actually, Daughters of Belitis, one of the original founders, passed away earlier this month. Um, Del, Del Martin was one of the original founders, um, and she passed away. And she was in her 90s when she passed. So, mm. so mm. We've, we're getting even closer to losing some of that, that history. But honestly, with gay history, the Making Gay History podcast is a wonderful one because it's based on oral history. 
and the uh, and the and the person who does it actually plays tapes from his own interviews in the 1990s with homosexual and LGBT history people from all over the country. Um, so that's a podcast. If you're really interested in learning more from a primary source base, that's a great way to start um, and st start getting more knowledge as well. That's awesome. Thank you for for that. I'm sure yeah. they'll appreciate when they pick up some new listeners from from this. Uh, it'd yeah. be great to have that outreach for them too. And and uh, uh, if we can get that book list from you at some point, that would be amazing too. It's no rush, but you know, it'd be awesome if for people who are who have uh, been watching today, listening today, or listening in the future because yep. we're just published now permanently uh, to have that in the in the links in the sections uh to be able to look back and say well here's a great google doc to be able to use it yes i will absolutely and i'll make sure that's available and in, in public and free um to open for anybody on the internet because i think it's an important thing to share when we have those resources and also my primary sources so if anybody wants to go and dig into what i was looking at mm -hmm. i mean the newsletters themselves were three 300 pages of newsletters wow. so i mean that's that's enough to be able to have fun for a year <laughs> Um, <laughs> I've only glimpsed through them. I've not even read all of them word for word because I haven't had I didn't have time. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll make sure that all the primary sources I looked at, everything will be there, so people can just go and have fun and, and see what what fits their interest and what they want to learn about. Awesome, that's great. Thank you so much, Nick. We really yeah. appreciate it. And yeah, you know, it's a great presentation. Great way Thank to uh, to just scratch the surface. Basically, apparently, when you have three hundred pages of newsletters you know it's like wow that'd be a great digitization project right there yeah, and i was thankful because it's all digitized it's all, oh, all kinds of sexual, yeah so it's already been digitized nice. with, with few months missing so that's where like the, my goal is to find those few months that are not included in those sets but um to have almost the majority of that mm -hmm. is amazing and yeah. have it accessible i mean the downside is you do have to have access to that database which is expensive on its own um, and so if you don't have a university affiliation, it could be challenging to get to get that. Right. Um, but it's still a, an awesome resource that you can access. And honestly, Archives of Sexuality and Gender is a great place, even if you're interested in women's history, or if you're interested in transgender history or any other f facets of gender and sexuality, it's a mm -hmm. great resource if you want to go just digging because you can find other great topics. Now's the time because we can't get to archives physically. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. And it, and it, it's all digitized from archives all over the country. And they did it as a huge project through um, collaboration. So it's a great resource if you have the access. If you don't, I know that's challenging at the moment for a lot of folks, um, but um, it's still a great resource if you do get access and want to dig. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you again, my friend. It's been great. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for reaching out and offering to give us this presentation. This has been fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, everybody who joined and for all the questions. And really fast, Kara, thank you. I appreciate your comment about my shirt. It's one of my favorites. Yes, it is a fabulous shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you, everyone, in the comment section. Uh, I'm sure both of us will be uh, posting some things in the comment section or liking and commenting back uh, as the days go on. Uh, so make sure you're all covered and, and everything's good to go. Uh, but once again, thank you, Nick. Uh, for, for this presentation. Glad you could be a part of, of today's digital conference. Thank you, everyone in the comments thank section you. For, for being a part of this. And thank you to everyone who's watching this a month from now because mm -hmm. you, know, you guys make this thing roll along and that's what we need to be doing. So take care, everyone. We have one more presentation today and then we are wrapping everything up. So we will see you in about uh, 30 minutes or so. Awesome. Thank you again, John. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Take care, everyone.